Hello and welcome to our series, My Country, My Faith. My name is Father Owen Gorman and we are coming to you from the Cathedral of Holy Trinity, which is the Cathedral Church of Ireland and Dan Patrick in Northern Ireland. This Cathedral Church is very special because according to tradition, St. Patrick himself is buried here and indeed quite close to this place is Schlemish Mountain, which uh, according to tradition was the place where where Patrick was held in captivity, where he prayed to God many times during the night and during the day. And when he came back to Ireland, prayer was very much central to his life and to his work of evangelization here. So in this program, we're going to be looking at the centrality of prayer, but particularly the prayer of the liturgy, of the Eucharist, of the Word made flesh, Jesus present amongst us, and its importance for our own lives and our life of faith. And here to discuss this with me is uh, Father David Jones, a hermit now in Ireland. And he's going to look at the Eucharist with me in relation to the Eucharistic Congress in Dublin. Father David, you're very welcome to our programme. Father, you come to us from Wales and there is a tradition that St. Patrick himself came from Wales and um, you know, to evangelise Ireland. Now, you're here in our midst as a hermit, you're living that lifestyle. But before you found your way into this lifestyle, you weren't even Catholic, you were, you were Baptist, weren't you? Mm. I was very much anti-Catholic and spending my time trying to convert Catholics to the true faith. And one day I wandered into a Catholic church. It was in the mid-60s or 67, 68 possibly, in Wales, just the nearest Catholic church. See what nonsense they were up to. And <laughs> I was not for the six. It was the Tridentine Mass still in Latin, because in that time, just after the council, it was still there for a few years, at least at 11 o'clock, just as it was, with an army of water boys and clouds of incense. And I thought, hmm, that's very uncomfortable. It's kind of too near the bone, looks as if it might be the real thing. <laughs> so anyway, I wasn't happy about that at all. But then I kept on being drawn back to that church, because it was the only church open. And then I'd walk in, you see, what's there? That box, that thing, it's awfully different from anything else in the church. And there was a kind of magnet there and an aura about it. And eventually, the Lord himself, I suppose, got me to understand, yes, it is the real thing. What are you going to do about it? So eventually I went to see the nearest priest I could find, who happened to be a Benedictine, because the nearest parish was a Benedictine parish, run by Ampleforth. Yes, I'll come this way, I'll sort you out, and maybe you can have a visit to Ampleforth on the fish, you see, for vocations. Right? Basil and Hume, of course, is the abbot. Oh, you've come from Cardiff. Yes, so anyway, so anyway, they received me to the church at Ampleforth under age, because it was a bit delicate, but they were very really kind anyway, but my parents just about consented. And so that was it, but I wanted to become a monk straight away, and eventually they made me go to university and things. But anyway, I did become a monk straight away, but in France. So I was in France for years and years. And Yes. Yeah. So after your, your training and you, like St. Patrick, heard the call of the Irish, you, you, you've come to Ireland. What is your observations of how things are here? You know, and everybody knows that we've been through a huge crisis here, uh, a huge loss of faith. Uh, how have you found things here in Ireland? In Ireland, what is there is that there's a continuity in the popular feeling that prayer and faith is still there by instinct, which is not the case in some other countries. Unfortunately, the B side is that it's the, it's the Irish brand, with the norm being the quickie on a Sunday. And your man, if you go on for five minutes, you're, you're in trouble. So basically, that's what we're up against, the lack of catechesis and the lack of liturgical life, which you have in, for instance, France. And if you're coming from a monastic setting, it's a bit of a nuisance. And so I don't particularly like celebrating in a parish setting. So I will if they want me to, but it's very uncomfortable because you're fighting against time. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that perhaps one of, the, one of the weaknesses of the Irish church traditionally has been the liturgy? One of the strengths has been the devotional mm. life, uh, the rosary mm. and our mm. devotion to mm. saints and, mm. and, and that. Mm. But liturgically, we're not there where perhaps the English are or, or the French are in terms of their love and their respect for the liturgy. No, and there's a process of osmosis too, because you see the speed of the popular devotion becomes that of the liturgy. Therefore, the Formula One rosary, is also that of the liturgy. Getting to the end is the optic. 
isn't it isn't it a kind of an issue of just let us fulfill the obligation exactly. rather than just let us Breathe. enter into communion with the Lord? Yes. Yeah. Your own approach to liturgy is different. Uh, the monastic one. Yeah. Mm. Explain what you are giving, what you are offering now, uh, Irish people, through your presence here. Essentially, there is the fact that in the hermitage, liturgy is done in the monastic life, fully sung and with great calm and thanksgiving, everything as in the monastery. But there is also the fact that people have asked me once a week and on feast days to celebrate a public mass and they want it in Latin because they can't get hold of it. So they come from all over the place to get the Latin mass once a week or if it's a feast or a first Friday as well. And so we have all the trimmings, incense, and as they would say, bells and smells, and it works, and it draws people from all over the place. Mm. You're very much in tune then with, with, with Pope Benedict's whole programme for the church, which seems to be the renewal of the faith through the renewal of the liturgy. Um, why do you think uh, Benedict has gone down that line? What is the link between renewing faith and, first of all, concentrating on the liturgy? Prayer is the lifeblood of the soul and it's only when God is able to get through that God then is able to get back his due and is able to heal because liturgy works vertically and horizontally and if we don't have good liturgy we have an impoverished, impoverished life mm. and liturgy is not well done on the parish level in Ireland therefore the life of the people suffers if you have access to something mystical for an hour or more, you're raised from the profane, from the, from the daily, from the worker day, to something beyond yourself. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in the Latin Mass that we have, we have all the trimmings, including utter silence in church before and after. People stay for a long time in prayer, come to confession. So the whole atmosphere is very much Godward. That's mm -hmm. the difference. God mm -hmm. is the center. Mm -hmm. Silence is, is a huge uh, need in all of our lives, but mm. it tends to be often pushed out of churches now that become very, very noisy before, during and after Mass with, with lots of activity. Do you think it's an abuse in some way or a lack of understanding of what Vatican Council taught in terms of active participation? Uh, isn't there a sense that what the Council meant by that is not that everybody doing everything, but uh, active in a different sense? Explain maybe the, the Latin behind that, mm. because that gets us to a deeper reality, yes, doesn't it? that's right. It's participatio actuosa. Now that does not mean active, but it means real effective. It means doing in the sense of engaging. It means actually participating in what's going on because what used to happen was this, your man was at the altar and they were starting off the rosary in, in the pews, even giving it out in public. And it's not exactly participating in what is really going on. It's praying all right, but the whole thing was not essentially changing radically actually the liturgy itself so much as changing attitudes to it. Any other change would be an expression of that, e.g. making it possible for that to happen. But it's not a question of doing everything, it's a question of actually entering into what's going on. And strangely enough, I feel there's more of that going on in the Tridentine Rite that we do on a Sunday than in most parishes because they, they really are vibrating with prayer. That's participation. Mm. Uh, so, if we're to understand this correctly, the actuosa, in terms of uh, what the Council is teaching, would be a more contemplative engagement with the mysteries that are unfolding That's before it. us, rather than this uh, doing, taking up the collection, you know, 20 people bringing up the gifts, you know, 15 Eucharistic ministers, all of that sort of stuff. So, it is, it is a prayerful, contemplative penetration and entry into the yes, liturgy. Yes, it's, it's experiencing the liturgy in its inner dynamic. Mm. Anything else is but the expression of it. And if that expression is more important than the other, it's counterproductive. Mm. Father, as, as part of your ministry here in Ireland, you hold Eucharistic healing ceremonies, Eucharistic healing retreats. Can you tell us something about that, what you do, you know, what's the format and what have the fruits of that been? Essentially, it's bringing people in direct contact with the Blessed Sacrament for the whole length of time, all night included so that they're keeping it going all night. And then all the meditations happen guided in front of the monster that is beside one is there and so they're looking at him. Mm -hmm. By the way, the hours, the divine office sung with the people and with meditations thrown in actually after, for instance, the reading at Lords and Vespers, there's a moment we can make a homily there, for instance. Mm -hmm. So using the fullness of the office, not said but sung, celebrated. Mm -hmm. And then one moment when one will also specifically ask the Lord to heal any present, because it's the same Lord who walked the streets of Galilee. Mm -hmm. If you've been to Lourdes and so on, where it happens, the bishop then blesses each one and things do happen. And 
we've had experiences, and uh, I could tell you one or two, but it's because it's the Lord there. You're not in the way at all. It's he's doing the whole thing himself. He just prepares the terrain for it to happen, make mm. it favorable, so people are actually receptive to what he wants to do with them. Mm. I think that we, we would wish to encourage people that um, not only you know, is the Lord's healing there for them on retreats that you would give, but he is there in their parish church. Exactly. He is there in the Blessed Sacrament. And mm. you know, if people go there through Mass, through adoration, through the stillness of, of maybe some time in the afternoon or evening, and if, if, if they ask, you know, they will receive. Mm. Isn't, isn't it really a question of helping people to, to go to the source to go to, to where Christ is and to have the faith, to pray for the faith, to believe that uh, he can do these wonderful things for them. Indeed, indeed. Healing is something which has to happen on every level of the person and only in a state of grace is complete healing obtained. One can't fix a bit of the person, it has to be the whole person. Therefore, it starts with the sacramental sphere, mm -hmm. to get the soul in peace because we're psychosomatic beings and one element affects the other. Mm. And you mentioned state of grace, so that obviously links us in to the importance of the sacrament of penance, of reconciliation, mm. as a very much intrinsic part of the healing indeed, process. And indeed, indeed. all the work which I would do with regard to retreat work would normally very much be orientated towards confession. Yeah. That's very important. And often that's where healing begins. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, just the other thing that we wish to, to bring out in this program is uh, the Eucharistic Congress in Dublin. This is a great opportunity for catechesis, for renewal, uh, for a whole revival of faith uh, within our country. The theme of the, the Congress for this year is communion uh, with God, communion with each other. We live perhaps at a time when maybe we, we take the communion with each other as, as perhaps uh, you know, something that we maybe absolutize, but it really begins with the Lord because from that, then the communion with, with each other happens. Um, don't you think it's, a, it, it's perhaps a tendency too much to, to almost, we're like social workers, we're perhaps spending too much time on the horizontal and not enough on the vertical? Yes, it's of course, the whole thrust of the Eucharistic spirituality of our present Holy Father, the vertical, and not the closed circuit, but the circuit of the people open at one end, that is all going in one direction. This element of wanting to celebrate ourselves, the community celebrating itself, is dubious. And if we're celebrating ourselves, e.g. clapping, the Lord is not the center of that glory, we are. Mm -hmm. And if we're holding hands and aware of the other person next to us, that's a very shallow communion, which takes away from the real communion. Because our communion is of a mystic type. Souls in a state of grace, therefore inhabited divinely, are therefore also, by extension, somehow interlinked and almost one inside the other. It's the same divine life, therefore we don't hurt each other. Therefore, true spiritual communion is because it's based on the love which is inhabiting us all, but therefore it has to start from there. If that's not there, anything else is very shallow. Mm. And um, one of the, the, the great tools perhaps that we should always emphasize uh, that is at the service of catechesis and, and renewal, particularly within the context of the liturgy, is the homily. Uh, now, I've had a lot of people say to Myself, over the years, a lot of lay people, Father, the homilies that we hear, they're, they haven't taught us, they're, they're more about, you know, let's be nice to each other, let's be good. But within your own tradition, which is a, a monastic, which is a, a, an eremitical tradition, uh, explain to us how you would see uh, the purpose of a homily. Mm. I'll just tell you how I do it, and then you'll see why I say it. When it comes to a Sunday or a feast or a first Friday coming, because I've got to a large extent the same ones there each time, I've got to give them new teaching each time. Now, therefore, what will I do? I'll go into the chapel and during the hours of the night, that is between vigils and lords, I'll wait for a word. Just wait for the Lord to give the message he wants for them. Therefore, it's not my word. Lord, what do you want me to tell them? And somehow a thought will come. Then you develop that thought. And then you pray intensely before actually preaching. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Let it be your word. And you don't know, but you're touching somebody out there. And they're also being recorded, therefore you're touching somebody out there. Because all these sermons are recorded. And it's amazing, actually, how something I hadn't thought of, the Lord put it on your mouth for that person present. Mm. 
It's funny, I would use the exact same method, uh, but I just wouldn't do it as early in the morning as you mm. do. Um, like, uh, very soon after I got ordained, uh, I said to myself, I'm, I'm not going to go down the approach of homilies, of spending it in front of the internet, cutting and pasting from other resources that are there. I said to myself, this will have to be a work of prayer. Mm. So I'd always expose the Blessed Sacrament, invoke the Holy Spirit, read the scripture passage and say, Lord, exactly the same prayer as you would say, help me to know what is your word for your people. And sometimes, you know, Father, like there could be some things that the Lord would put before you that you might be afraid to even speak about some of the moral issues and the moral questions of these times. But being in the presence of the Lord gives you strength. Yes. I find that the Lord helps you overcome your fear and tend to be a teacher of truth and a proclaimer of his word in the fullness. And I think that, um, that, that that is probably the key. It has to be a spiritual work. It has yes. to be a work of prayer yes. and then return from the preaching to prayer once again. Mm. Yes. You mentioned that your homilies, your resources are recorded. Mm. Uh, these are obviously now available for people, are they? Yes. What happened was way back, people had said amongst themselves, well, look, it's a pity these can't be kept, not lost in the air like that, because there's teaching in there, because I would give them from week to week teaching, catechesis, doctrinal formation and they weren't getting it elsewhere. So you'd get people drifting into the Latin one, not because they wanted the Latin, because they wanted good teaching. Mm -hmm. And most of the people there, I would say, are not particularly Latin inclined. Mm -hmm. They just want a good celebration. This so, is the, this yes, the Latin, the Latin one, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. How long would your homilies be? It, well, if you want to see them or hear them, because actually a lot of them are actually videoed, but all of them are audioed. It, it gives the exact time of each one. Normally, um, I wouldn't go on for more than a quarter of an hour unless it were actually a prayer group, a teaching which they want developed. That's different. But you don't want to go more. Otherwise, you, I've got children present for one thing. And you can't, although if you give a teaching in story form, you've got the children as well. Mm. Yes. Mm. But no, I wouldn't normally go more than 15 minutes. But you can do a lot in 15 minutes now if it's well thought and not waste time. Mm. All of these are important uh, instruments for the renewal of faith in Ireland. And as we mentioned earlier, they we're coming out of a, a very bad context. Uh, over 40 years or so, people haven't got the fullness of teaching that they should have had, uh, what has been their baptismal right. But uh, with, the con with this, uh, this Eucharistic Congress that we have, um, we obviously need to start teaching people about the Eucharist once again. Would you agree that uh, Catholics' understanding of even the basics, the rudiments about uh, the Eucharist, tends to be very weak? In Ireland, I found it amazingly weak, actually. And I think it's partly linked with the deficient uh, catechesis on school level. Because one hears children saying strange things like holy bread, blessed bread. Where's that coming from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they don't seem to know what they're doing, some of them. Mm -hmm. And the whole way it's done is very casual. It's a very profound issue because you see, because if you've got people coming up with serious sin on the conscience, it's all murky and that's not helping their souls at all. It's a whole, you can't just give a bit of the teaching. You have to teach exactly what the conditions are for making a profitable communion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What message would you give? What basic things would you reinforce if you were at uh, this Congress? What would be the things that you would be saying, this is what we need to teach and preach? I would use what is there in the structure and revitalize it and purify it. E.g. one concrete issue which is not indifferent, and you'll see why when I get to the end, it's this question of insisting on the brevity of the most important moment of our lives. Holy Communion has to be as short as possible so as to get onto the church notices. That's the most important moment in the church's life. You've got these people coming to their Lord. It's a sponsal moment. And there, he's into the parish bulletin straight away, even before the post-communion prayer. And all this army of non-consecrated hands, it's not healthy because it banalizes the thing. It's all just anything like anything in any day life. No, time. Because if we really thought out the thing, we would do things, we would emphasize, for instance, lay ministries of music ministry to sustain a good communion made calmly, creating beauty like the charismatics, sustaining an atmosphere. That's a moment of encounter which needs calm. All this insistence, get the thing over as quickly as possible, therefore have an army of people to hurry it up. It's nonsense. The Lord isn't free to bless that. Mm. And as you say yourself, this has to be seen as, as the summit of our lives. This has to be seen as the most crucial and important uh, uh, encounter and that um, it's more than just fulfilling an obligation. It is spousal, it is, it is unitive, it is, 
the most important relationship of our lives. Mm. Uh, Father, where uh, can people contact you? Where is your information on the internet? What uh, uh, resources are there available for them? Yes, no, there are two separate questions there. They wouldn't contact me because that was the condition I gave to the, the friend who set up the website because he wanted to have this available for people. That they don't actually contact me. Anyone who wants to contact me, the only way would be a classical letter, because I haven't got email. It just has to be a classical letter to the Hermitage at Duleek, County Meath, in Ireland. But the actual website, it's someone else who does it, but he does it very well. And if one, if one just Googles my name, Father David Jones, FR, Father David Jones, any Google or any search will find immediately the website. It's the first thing that comes up. And then you've got all these things in there, including all these um, sermons and retreats, and a lot of them also are on video as well. So it's, it's a resource center, but it's safe. It's, it's Catholic teaching, that's all. And even not being present, you can make a retreat you can even do the rosary, it's all there. Okay. Mm. Father, thank you for your wisdom, thank you for your time uh, that you've taken to be with us and I know that you enjoy a very rich life of prayer from very early in the morning when I'm still in my bed to, to uh, late in the evening but uh, please remember us all in, in your prayers and as we will remember you. So I wish to thank each and every one of you for joining us for this program on My Country, My Faith. And please remember Father David and indeed all of the Irish uh, now in our prayers. Although Father David is not Irish, he is, I suppose, an adopted Irishman here. And it is wonderful to have his presence and uh, his spiritual strength amongst us as Patrick came uh, centuries ago to help in the evangelization of our country. Uh, we are delighted to have him with us now to help in the same. God bless you all and, and please join us again for another episode of My Country, My Faith.